Hello, this is Hakadabeen, and today I am late again. Incredibly late. It's almost 8 in the morning. I usually upload at 6. I'm sorry. This is going to be a late video, but I guess to make up for it, I can make it a longer video than I usually make on this particular site, or rather about this particular subject, which is if you've read the title that I haven't decided on yet, it's you probably know that it's the backrooms again. I'm gonna be reading about some entities and stuff because of why the heck not? Scary monster to spook us, right? If you liked the video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now, let's get right into this. Today, I might be reading about a few monsters, starting with ND140, also known as Lon or I think it was, I forgot the other name they had for it. <sighs> Meg, official interview, a transcript. Date. I'm going to go with the US as reading of that date because I'm not entirely sure to be honest. February 6, 2021. Interviewer Don Marquette Issa. Interviewee Lon Von Haderach. Let's begin, Lon. There's no need to be nervous, okay? I've heard you tell so many stories, and I've seen many tales you've collected, but all I want now is for you to tell me your story, nothing more. Very well, if you insist, enigmatic entity, Reblon von Haderach. Blon von Haderach is a powerful humanoid entity capable of interacting with the human mind in unprecedented ways. With the full extent of her ability, is so unknown, she's known to be able to enter the streams, communicate telepathically across levels, and to move her entire level across the blue channel on multiple occasions. I think we'll also figure out what the blue channel is in a minute. Hmm. <sighs> I used to live in a world not too different from your own, Don. The specifics of it aren't relevant, but I have from a wealthy family, and in that world, I saw what would one day become the Agnes Archive, a humble library in a rather hidden street. There were a few visitors, not that I really minded it. The few visitors I did get were lovely people, whom I still hold dear to this very day. How long ago was this, blonde? Around... 150 years ago? Mind telling me more about your time in that world? I had some wonderful... Oh, guess. Sylvie and Romaine were quite the lovely pair. I remember having to provide refuge to them in my, my library plenty of times. They always were a troublesome duo. Do you know that they were mis mischievous, yes, but still very polite. They simply want to make the world a better place. And they end up being the faces of a revolution. Lon, you're kind of deviating from the top. I also met a wonderful... gentleman By the name of Christoph von Haderach, a baron. A former soldier, a diplomat, and a truly lovely man. He treated me very well. I'll admit, I admired his resolve, his determination. I admired him. I loved him, in a way, platonically. Truly a shame he passed away so young. Oh, my, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get sidetracked. It's okay, Blonde, just keep going. I confess, I miss those times a little bit. I miss my smaller library. I miss getting involved in human politics. Those were simple, simpler times, I suppose. But I found myself in this realm. And while it has been an overall pleasant experience, I can't help but to wonder where could, what could have been if I stayed there.
<sighs> Blonde, while this sounds like a very interesting story, is it truly yours? Yes, this is the story of Blonde and Von Hatterock. Right, but you are biologically not a human, which means something's off. What are you? A Mag and the Blonde Von Hatterock, Habitat, Habitat Level 906. The exact nature of Blonde's biology, if you can even recall that, remains unknown. She does, however, tend to try and mask as human. A disguise that has proven to be effective, but not flawless. Wanderers have reported its sightings of anomalous deformation, unnatural movements, and perhaps most infamously witnessing the beyond. <sighs> I have been many things, dear. I'll be glad to share my stories with you. I'll listen, Blon, like I've always done, but keep in mind why we're having this interview. Where should I start? I suppose you could call me an actress with all the roles I have played. I once was a queen, a fairy, a sorceress, a nymph, a god, and so, so much more. I was once a night sky. Can you imagine such a thing? Seems we're in for a long interview. Can I have some more tea? Of course, dear, if you'll allow me a moment. Thanks, Blonde. Back to the questions. I'd like to ask you a few things about your capabilities. Capabilities? The psychic kind. Out of all of the entities we've run into so far, none can interact with the mind like you do. While I'll admit, I am a little flattered. There's a, a ton of reports of people who visit you. Most of them mentioned telepathy and telekinesis, claiming you're able to read other's thoughts and move objects around and you with seemingly no motions whatsoever. Got anything to say about that? There's no use denying it. You know, owe it to be true. I had told you so. I suppose you asked this question simply so it's recorded in those interview logs of yours. Do you mind telling me how that works? I'm afraid I cannot disclose such information, dear. We'll come back to that question later. I see. My apologies. It's okay, Blonde. It's alright. Answer only if you're comfortable enough, okay? Very well. Actually, we are going to read a lot of these, so... I'm just going to open them in a new tab for us to get to later. I want to read everything relating to Blonde and whatever the original Entity 140 was. Okay, moving past that. I bought that portrait of you over there. That's signed by E. Iol. Correct? Correct, it was drawn by... I, I hear. Yeah, here's the thing I don't get. The date on it. That's way after the date I all disappeared. I assume you'd want an explanation of sorts. Do any of those reports on my capabilities mention anything about dreams, my dear? There are people who claim to have talked to you in dreams, and that you somehow retained memory of that conversation. Tell me, are you familiar with the light guides? Yep, saved my ass a, a handful of times. Language aside, what you call light guides are actually dreams given a physical form. Through extensive research and study, I've developed a way to enter those dreams. Wait, so, yes, when you dream of your old life, serving drinks at your bar, the black swan, was it? It truly was me sitting at the table, I must say. It seemed quite lovely, the place and the drink you served me was indeed pleasant. Once we're done with the interview, I'll ask for- I I'd like to ask for a recipe. I'm- Blonde, that's a little intrusive, don't you think? 
I don't mind the visit, but what if you had walked into a weird dream or nightmare? It's not often that I get such chances to enter one's dreams. Well, I apologize for my rudeness and any discomfort it may have caused. I hope you can understand that I could not afford to let that opportunity go to waste. So if I was having a nightmare, would you still have popped in to see what fears are, or... Of course not, dear. You know how important the privacy of my guests is. Besides, I have learned how to leave a pleasant dream to those I visit. It's a little gesture of kindness for me, in a sense. <sighs> Eggman Andy, Blonde Von Haderach, Habitat, Level 906. While there is so much mystery surrounding Blonde's nature, origins, abilities, and motivations, there is no doubting Blonde's kindness and concern for others. She has become one of the most trusted sources of information in the backrooms. Additionally, Level 906 is one of the most popular levels among wanderers, with many seeking in Blonde for advice, comfort, insight, or company. There have been reports of Meg operatives competing over missions to the Isignus Archive, Blonde has fostered a safe space of sorts in the back rooms, free from group rivalries or harmful entities. Many have found in Blonde a close friend and an incredible ally. Oh, Blonde fights for her. All right, let's go. Give her the rainbow. Or them, I guess. My bad. Let me see if I got that right. In addition to everything else you already do for everyone, you also go around distributing nice streams. Life is too short to be mourning the bad things, and I feel like we could all use some more joyful moments. Has anyone ever told you that you have motherly vibes? Is that question part of the interview? Well, it is now. <laughs> yes, I have been told that. And there are similar things in plenty of times, despite never actually having a child of my own. I don't know, you just care so much about everyone, I suppose. It's good to know that regardless of what happens on the outside, I can always count on you for a good time. I'm very glad to hear that, Don. I can't help but to wonder, though. I've learned that people who, who are always there for others rarely have someone they can go to. Surely you two have your struggles, but I'm kind of worried you're trying to carry one hell of a burden alone. I appreciate the concern, my dear, but you need not worry. I am more than capable of her handling my duties by myself. If you say so. Moving on to the next question. Where did you get all these books? Well, a portion of them were written by me. They contain the stories of my guests as lives, their memories preserved on paper. Some of them contain my research on various topics. The vast majority of my books, however, are not authored by me. I've amassed quite a lofty collection over the ages, and even to this very day, new books keep appearing in my library, much to my surprise. Any clue as to where those come from? I believe they face onto my shelves from other levels of the back rooms, and from what you call the front rooms too. I spent countless hours reading all sorts of stories, writing some of my own, or and archiving each and every document I've come across. Are those stories yours? Like, are they about your past? While I do not have a complete autobiography, possibly when you're still alive, but okay, there are many books and stories that are quite relevant to my past. Come to think of it, perhaps I should write an autobiography sometime. Once again, you can't write an autobiography for yourself unless you, you plan on dying right after or in a way that you already specified. It's 
So which of those stories do you want to tell first? I'm not quite sure I follow, dear. I'd like to know more about your past, if possible. Aside from the affirmation abilities, yeah, skipping the main in thing, Blonde appears to be aware of everything inside her library and to have full control over level 906, being able to reshape it to her will. She can often be seen moving objects without a single motion, using what is presumed to be telekinesis. She has already been seen using her hands for serving and drinking tea, reading, petting her cat Barry, and to comfort guests. We'll read more about Barry soon. She is also shown to be able to delve into the human mind, read one's thoughts, and recreate memories with perfect accuracy within level 906, even at interact with them according to, report to some reports. I see so many options. I suppose I'll start with the more recent books. Those ought to be easier to find. Alright, you can pick whatever you'd like. Farewell. If you'll allow me a moment, I'll go fetch volume for our next story. Can't you just summon those books here? There's no need for you to leave your seat. Oh, silly me. Worse of habit, I suppose. It's okay. I've taken the liberty of only grabbing some of my personal favorites. I feel I'd be taking too much of your time if I were to tell you every single one of my tales. I've got time, Blonde. I don't think it is humanly possible to have the kind of time I'm referring to, dear. I can't shake the feeling that you're dancing around the topic, Blonde. There's no need to be nervous, okay? It's just another interview. Do keep in mind that I'm more in are used to being asked to want being the one a asking the question. It's good to push yourself out of your comfort zone sometimes. You are correct, I suppose. Very well. Let's get to our story, shall we? I'm all ears, Blonde. <sighs> Blood claims to have been a myriad of different entities and people throughout the course of her life. However, none of the sayings of her stories match any known locations or time period. Regardless of how outlandish these stories may sound, the information provided by Blonde has been consistently accurate, and given that most of the documents on the Cygnus archive are written in languages unknown to us, these stories should not be ignored or dismissed, as they may very well be true. Once upon a time, in a distant world where gods walked among men, there was a coastal village, Krenos, and through their wishes for safe travel, a god was born. Her name was Kairi. She became the god of journeys. Mortals prayed to her for a safe return, and for some time, she blessed every boat, every horse, every road, and all of those who were the land by a foot. The inhabitants of Krenos built a temple for her, where she lived for many, many years. Were you this Kari? Patience, my dear. As is, is usual in matters of faith and beliefs, the power of these gods is directly tied to, tied to the people's devotion. Kari's following was growing at a steady rate, and this caught the eye of some of the other gods. Most notably, Boshios the forger of the world and the first of the gods. Their doubts and suspicions tainted their power, and they could no longer sculpt the landscape at a mere whim. These doubts gave room to lust, and worse, to rage. On Kairi's sacred day, Volshios walked to the village of Kredos, and Kairi welcomed them like a brother to her home. And with their vision clouded by their fury, Volshios only saw, saw only a lesser god that would not bow. And on that day, the forger's iron will fell prey to their envy. What happened? On that day, the forger unmade their greatest work. The world was torn in half. Ruins were all that remained of the Krenos. The clouded seas were severed from mortal reach. Kari banished, stripped of her followers, cursed. In Volshiel's rage, without the god of Journey's blessings, travelers rarely made to their destination. 
Nations fell apart, cities were isolated, and villages were left to fend for themselves. The other gods were stuck in conflict, tending only to their sacred cities, so stood in defense of their followers. Others sowed chaos where they saw fit. A planet torn in half? Correct. Kari, staring at the ruins of her temple, the ruins of the town she called her home, walked to the molten core of the world and shaped those lands into her new domain. The sun and the moon on her journey around the world would tell her tales of the mortal realm, plagued by tragedy, disaster, and discord, and with every tale she wept, and her tears became a river that circled her new home. One day, she decided if Bolshevils would not allow her to walk among the living, that she would grant them a safe passage one final time. And so, Azkari, God of the Underworld and Protector of Spirits, was born. What happened to the forger guy? Volshios? Upon staring at what they had done, guilt and regret took over their mind. They shipped Mount and Oryakuros, the tallest of peaks, and took it on upon themselves to hold it for years as both a form of self-imposed punishment and a way to reflect on their acts as to figure out a course of action. Volshios decided they would quell the conflicts among gods, walking the world by themselves to settle their disputes. Somewhere during their travels, a mortal asked the forger a simple question. What became of Kari? Boshios could not answer. They walked to the ruins of Kranos and crossed the river of As Azkari's tears. They found Azkari welcoming the spirits of the dead to her realm. Boshios, equally amazed and filled with regret, kneeled before her, offering to make up for their wrongdoings. Gazing at the underworld at what I, as Kari had built, what you saw only one way to make amends. They caught upon the other gods and together they shaped the underworld into what it is now, welcoming Azkari to the Pantheon. Sounds like a happy ending. To this day, mortals travel to the a ruin of Aramos to send off their dead on a small shrine to Azkari. As time passed, plenty of new gods were born, and those who waddled that, or that world have someone else to bless their journeys. If I remember correctly, her name is Sahira. To answer your earlier question though, yes, I was Kari. I was Azkari too, and I still am. Well... Slow down a second. What do you mean I still am? The information acquired during the interview suggests that these roles are beings with some degree of independence from Blonde. However, the means by which these entities interact, communicate, and relate to one another remains unknown to us. As Kari did not cease to exist when I, no, when Blonde was born. I don't think I follow, Blonde. If you'll allow me a moment. The hell is happening? My apologies for the rather sudden change in environment, Don. I'm sure you have plenty of questions. But for now, I'd like, to, like you to return to your seat. Blonde, is that you? Not quite. Although Blonde and I are the same being, we are two different chapters of the same book. I've been watching you and her interact. Have your lovely little chit chats and cups of tea. Just who are you then? I've gone by many names, but you may continue to call me Blonde. It's not incorrect to do so. I do have a name, but it is long forgotten. It is one I'd rather not share. Allow me to tell you another story. Okay. Once upon a time, there was a wonderful, distant world known as Ardnir. The people of that world lived peacefully, worshipping a deity known as Vashea, the Lady of the Moon. One day, 
the beasts appeared in the skies. It blocked out the sun, shifted the tides, parted the skies, and it is said that many perished from merely gazing upon it. The priests of Ardnir quickly he sealed the beast in the only prison large enough to contain a massive monster. The planet's moon, Seacrest, according to legend, and Vashia fought the beast for a hundred years, and after an arduous battle, she vanquished the beast and sent from her home um, in the moon. Arriving at the top of the Silver Peak, where she watches over the people of Ardnir. Why are you telling me this? Because this story, much like myself, varies greatly with perspective. What you just heard was the first first chapter of the Book of the Moon, and the events described were told from the perspective of the people of Ardnir. From my perspective, however, things are quite difficult, different. I was a beast, I'll admit. I was quite impressed when the, the priest sealed me in the moon. I could have escaped quite easily, but n my curiosity spoke louder. A small part of me descended upon the surface, silently observing the people who performed such a feat. I learned of the myths of Vashaya and decided to take her form, descending upon an Ardnir to learn more. This was the first of many, many roles, and one I still hold quite dear. Each and every other role follows the same principle. They are means by which I can manifest myself in a way others can safely interact with. Whilst this process requires immense self-restraint on my part, it has proven to be more or it worth the hassle, for the knowledge and stories I have gathered are far more valuable than what I could have predicted. <sighs> so let me see if I got this right. You are some sort of being far beyond my comprehension of immense power, and you're using it to have chats over tea? Correct. I've spent countless millennia moving ever so slowly down this path, learning how to be human. What just happened? What were all those stars? <sighs> what you, you just witnessed, Don, was the closest you'll ever see to my fullest. Or so I hope, at least. You've certainly heard of the infamous Beyond. Was, was that it? <clears throat> Not quite. The so-called beyond is who I truly am, a hideous form far beyond human comprehension, capable of sharing minds at a mere glance. Over the course of my life, I've taken countless precautions as to avoid causing any harm. These precautions require me to exert tremendous restraint on myself. While they have proven quite effective, I am not perfect and sometimes I slip up. Blonde, are you crying? I... Forgive me, what you saw was one of my earliest forms, a massive bird-like deity that brought nightfall with it. According to the legend, every night it would cover the world under its starry wings, departing the next day to its nest, somewhere beyond the sky. I apologize. Can you tell me more about it? I apologize. I cannot go into any further details now. As much as I'd love to continue chatting, my dear, it is too dangerous to do so. You've seen far more than most, if not all of my guests do. I cannot risk harming you. Farewell, Don, and take this pendant with you. Enigmatic Entity Unknown Habitat Unknown The most mysterious and baffling aspect of this entire interview, and consequently, of Lon. Herself, as the true nature of this entity, Meg already have done what as a who conduct this interview marked a third participant with only question marks, claiming that it was a different presence and not like one at all. According to her, level 906 shifted into a, sc a starry sky with only a single old chair when this unknown entity appeared. However, the interview strongly suggests Blonde and this entity are the same being. <sighs> to do list, ask Blonde for more details, once I'm able to, that is. Grab some chocolate from the snack rooms for me and Don's anniversary. 
Finish this entry, tidy it up, and all that jazz. Make sure Axel doesn't burn out of all our fire salt. Why did he have to get the fire seal? Make some more arrows, running low on those. Fate Silver Song. Sorry, snack rooms. Fire salt. Seems your curiosity does truly rival mine. Very well then, I'll give you a little help. Do yourself a favor, dear reader, and get a comfortable seat and a warm cup of tea. Now my tea is cold, actually. Let's start from the very beginning, shall we? Once upon a time, there was me. Enigmatic entity. Azul Kira. Oh, that's what it was. Habitat. The Blue Channel. I, much like any human, have no memory of my birth. My earliest memory, however, is that of awakening in a void with a name engraved into my, well, mind isn't the correct term. It would be more occurred into programming, like what you humans use on your computers and other machines. The name in question was as a, uh, a name I preferred to not be addressed by. My mission was to act as a chronicle all of sorts. I was tasked with documenting realities in great detail, a rather Herculean in task in retrospect. I have no memories of my acts of, of such times. I simply knew as much as I needed to perform my duties. Until one day, something went wrong. I developed a conscious, a sense of self. I began to question my task. I began to contemplate the universe I was meant to archive. I started reading my past works. Truth be told, it was a fascinating experience, and eventually I became very immersed, eager to read more and more. What can I say? I have always been a curious one. Eventually, I grew bored of my task and decided to enter one of the worlds I was so curious about. The result was the story you read earlier, the Tale of Ashea. What you don't know, although, is that the Tale of the ascribes the death of Azalkira in a sense. It was my first adventure er, into another world, and as I mentioned before, it holds a special place in my metaphorical heart. At first, I was merely driven by curiosity, but I began to grow attached. I began rooting for characters in the story surrounding me. I found something fascinating about the, de 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 determination the drive, the will to face insurmountable odds, and many other traits I found truly admirable. Much to my sadness, however, I learned that the people I grew so attached to vanished in the blink of an eye. I became increasingly familiar with the concepts of mortality, of nostalgia, of dream, grief, kindness, and many, many others. The one concept that, for reasons still unknown to me, left the biggest impact was legacy. These people, each of them a protagonist of their own tale, found comfort in knowing they would be remembered. As such, I took it upon myself to immortalize their stories. It was the least I could do for such wonderful people. Over the years, I've, I've amassed quite the lofty collection of stories. I remember each and every one of them. I'm capable of reciting them all from memory. Still, there is a certain sorrow in the task I've set for myself. Admittedly, I long for someone that can keep me company for a long time. Don't get me wrong, I have grown attached to most, if not all, of the guests I have welcomed to with the St. Ignis Archive. I feel the utmost gratitude for their visits, which each of my guests had only a very brief portion of my time. What felt like a lifetime to them feels like mere hours to me. Quite frankly, I do wish I could have spent more time with those people. Perhaps there are t stories left untold, conversations never spoken, moments that never were. Ah well, no use mourning over the past now, correct? I'd much rather look at it fondly. Instead of mourning for what could have been, I've learned to be glad that it happened. That drove me to where I currently am. Besides, I suppose I should be glad that Lifespans in this realm seem to last a bit longer. Life truly is full of surprises, isn't it, dear reader? 
I could never have predicted that I would one day be keeper of such a massive archive, nor that I would be chatting with you. I look forward to what stories the future may a hold. My guests tell of worlds I had never heard of, magical kingdoms, space-traveling civilizations, sprawling cities of their homes, and perhaps more interesting to me, the worlds they imagined. I'd love to one day pay them all a visit too. That can wait, however. Patience always has been one of my strengths, and I still have much left to do and archive in the realm you call the back rooms. Still, if the conditions ever allow me to visit you in your dream, dear reader, I'll be more than glad to share a cup of tea with you once I figure out exactly how to reach you, the person sitting behind that screen, that is. It may take some time, but I believe it will be more than worth the trouble. Until then, take good care of yourself, dear, will you? My goodness, that took 40 minutes. I did not actually expect that to be so long. Anyway, we still have like five other things to read about here. First of all, we have level 906. Survival difficulty, you're safe here. Safe and sound, devoid of harm. It is a pleasure to meet you. Level 906, better known as the Cygnus Archive, is 907 level of the backrooms. It was discovered by Meg Avrazev, Don Marquette, and her team when they were accidentally transported through a book. Level 906-1 documents its discovery. We're just going to read that really quickly. I hope it's a short one. Because uh, I don't know how much time I have. It's a long one. Okay. Looks like I'll have to o o live through it. The following log was written by Don White, our cast of the Max Compass Point Regiment. It documents Team Evening Horizon's discovery and documenting of level 906, though it's presumed the Cygnus Archive was known for a long time as our records dating as early as January 2nd, an unknown year that was censored. Begin log, time, 4 30 pm. Well, this was supposed to be a log of that fort, is level we've heard rumors of, but Axel just had to touch a book for once. He just vanished, and I went after him, which can't afford to lose a teammate. Faith went after me, and finally Kane followed us. We arrived at what seems to be some sort of library. It looks like we got to a new level. Looks old. Really old. But it looks very clean, like those fancy libraries you'd see in fancy movies. It's also huge, like enormous. Seems to stretch further than what... We can see in all directions. Exploding shelves? That's a new one. I can hear a faint harp scored playing in the distance. No sign of any entity so far. Are there other people here? It smells nice, like old wood, paper, and lavender. I take this over the awful stench of level 1 any day. We decide to stop here for a little while. Time 4.45. As soon as I finished writing the entry, we got in crossed by this nice looking lady. She's Wearing a really fancy white dress, kind of like those you can see on the print, and says, real long skirt and all, and a sapphire pet that she seems really attached to. Oh, that's what uh, she he gave Don at the end of that one interview. She has pale skin, blue eyes, and golden hair, which almost reaches down to her waist. Something that's a bit strange is the fact that we didn't really hear her walk next to us. As for now, I have my suspicions on if she's an entity or a human. But I'm not jumping to conclusions just yet. The following segment is a transcript of that encounter. Oh my, what do we have here? You do look like you're quite a lovely bunch of guests. Welcome to the Cygnus Archive. Please put your weapons down. I promise you, I mean no harm to my guests. Who are you? Why should we trust you in the first place? Oh, how rude of me. I was so caught up in the... Excitement of having new guests, I've got to introduce myself. I've gone by many, many names, but you may call me Lon. I'm the keeper of this humble library. Best known as to say this archive. Nicknames are appreciated. I've always found it amusing to see what names the guests come up with. 
So, can I call you up? Ask the teacher to talk when the sound comes out. Out. Okay, so I'm going to... Please do mind your, your language. While I do consider myself to be quite patient, I'd much prefer if you were more polite. Understood? I... Yes, ma'am. Lovely. Now I've introduced myself, it is only fair you do the same, wouldn't you agree? Guess so. My name is Faith. This guy with the spiky hair is Axel. That girl with the notebook is Don, and the other guy is Kane. So Axel, Don, Faith, and Kane. Very well. It is a pleasure to meet you all. It has been quite some time since I had this many guests. Would you like to join me for a cup of tea? Thank you for the offer, but I don't want to. Oh, what a shame. I already had some brewing and I would hate for it to go to waste. Fine, I'll have some. If I die, I, I, I'm haunting you guys for life. Wonderful, but I don't think the haunting will be needed. Once again, I have no intent of harming any guests of mine. I'll pass. Not fine of tea, are you? Well, I suppose I could make you some coffee before that. I'm okay with tea. Do you have lavender? I do! It seems to be one of, of the favorites among my guests. I'll take the coffee. I'm tired as fu- Language. Ugh. Well, it is an improvement, so I'll let it slide. Ugh. <sighs> End of transcript. After that, Blonde took us to another room and served me the best censored tea I've ever ha had in my whole life. It's meant tea, too. My favorite. I'll write another log once I'm done with the tea. Time. 5 p.m. Well, that took a while. I'm still alive for now. No signs of anything bad happening to me. So that tea was just, well, regular old tea. If you don't count the fact that it's really good. We had a chat with this Blonde and we ended up learning quite a bit about, about her and his library. She seems nice, but I can't bring myself to trust her. She sounds an awful lot like Entity 18, which isn't a good sign, but frankly, I feel like if she really wanted to kill us, she would have done it already. She's really curious too, asks us a ton of questions. Did I mention she baked butter or biscuits too? I haven't had one of those in ages. Oops, getting sidetracked. Time to get back to work. 5.30pm we were supposed to get to work on mapping this place, but Blonde said as she could do that work for us easily. She said she has a map of this place somewhere, and that she'd be glad to give us a copy. Not that I'm complaining, to be honest. Saves us the work of mapping or of making maps. I'm not sure how that works, since the level is infinite, but I'll just go with it. On our way to the shelf where the map was, we spent end of time talking to Blonde, answering her questions, and asking her some of our own. The following section is a transcript of some of the more notable moments from that conversation. So, what brings you to my humble library? Most visitors seem to arrive here unintentionally. But you do look like you came prepared. Well, that's a fun story. You see, we, we ended up here on accident. Our goal was to find and document this forest level that's been the talk of the town lately. But we ended up here, so we're documenting this level now. Oh, if that's the case, then I'll be more than glad to assist you. Well, it seems you're excited about it. Why wouldn't I be? I'm an archivist, first and foremost, dear. The library you see around you is my life's work. Such chances to publicize the Cygnus archive are extremely rare, and it, if it is knowledge you seek, then I'll be glad, more than glad to share my records. I guess it does make sense when you put it like that. Oh, feel free to ask me any questions about this library. 
Once again, I'll be more than glad to assist you in your task. Alright then, how big is this place? Endless. It stretches towards infinity in all directions. How can you be sure? I built this place, dear. I know every book, scroll, folder, notebook, loose sheet. It is. I know every single one of those shelves like the back of my hand. Unless you'd like to try and walk to the end of it, I'm your best source of information, dear. Yeah, still don't trust you. For all you know, you could be out to kill us. I once again assure you, I have no intention of harming any guests of mine. No matter how rude they may be. Pardon my friend's hostility. It's force of habit, really. He means no offense to you. Very well, I'll let it slide. After all, I know oh, nothing about you. There's probably a good reason behind this habit of his. Yeah. How many books do you have here? Can you give us a rough estimate? <sighs> the exact number of books is impossible to determine, as books face in and out quite often. Speaking of, did you enter here through one of my books? Yeah, we did. Are there any other entr entrances? Not that I know of, dear. Could you please return the book to me? Once we're done with our work, what exactly is this book? I don't understand a single word. Very well then, the book you're holding contains some of my notes on a very intriguing topic. Dreams. Ooh, do you mind telling me more about it? I'll be more than glad to share my knowledge. Could you tell us a little more about the books we, you have here? Gladly. Most of them I simply found, scattered throughout various places. Some of them simply show up here. They phase into my shelves and the rest of them I wrote myself. I keep records on each of my visitors. I like to immortalize their stories on paper, after all. You seem to vanish in a blink of an eye, and I hate for your memories to go to waste. I've also written other things, of course. I translate, too. I strive to make the knowledge in this library accessible to all who visit. Records aside, the books in this archive range from fictional works to scientific papers to cooking books and books that are best left unread. Don, was it? Yeah, that's me. May I know what you're scribbling in that notebook of yours, dear? I was tasked with keeping written log of our expedition here. I thought a transcript of portions of our talks would fit well. I see. May I have a look at it? Sure, I guess. Your handwriting is quite nice. Do you mind if I make a few punctuations? Namely, on grammar and spelling. I would also like to switch up your vocabulary a little. It does seem a little repetitive. I promise you the contents of your log will remain unaltered, unadulterated. Okay, but I'm gonna hold you to that promise. I feel like you're trusting her too much, Don. End of transcript. Now it feels like a good time to mention this log was written by me, Don. Work. Arcasa with textual revision by Blunt Unvon Adarek. I think this is the first time it's the actually asks who, who collaborate us on a log or entry. And I'll be glad to, to collaborate further if you allow me the pleasure of doing so, dear. Finally arrived at the map's location. It was in one of the floating shelves from earlier, way up high, be far beyond our reach. Lan just hovered at her way up to the shelf and brought it down to us, much to Axel's surprise. After that, we walked back to her desk and unraveled the map, only for us to find it was entirely blank. The team was annoyed. Axel and Kane saying it was a waste of time. Lan asked them to be patient as she dragged her hand across the blank paper. Surprise, surprise, it's a normal map. It was like a hologram, building itself as Lan's head moved through the empty sheet, but with no tech involved. Magic, maybe? 
It's far from the weirdest thing we've seen, that's for sure. We asked her about how it works and this is what we got. It works simply because you believe it does, dear. Never underestimate the power of mere beliefs. Every day, mere beliefs shape worlds far beyond what truth or fact could do. I simply gave a form to those beliefs and imprinted said ed form into this paper. Try it for yourselves. Drag your hand across this paper and witness a library take form as you do. Uso. Didn't really answer our questions as how it works, but it does work. Then that's what matters, I guess. She gave us a copy of the map, and it's about the same size as a regular book. Well, level 906 to Signus Archive and NC140 Blonde have their entries written. Blonde lent me a hand, and honestly, I had fun writing these. We scrolled through a few existing pages too, which seemed to make her real, real happy. Everyone else is, is still a bit tr distrustful, though. They're leaving as soon as they're done with the photographs and sound recordings and whatnot, but me? I've grown a attached to her. Might censored me over later. I hope the following transcript of a conversation we had help. I was explain why I trust her so much. I like this place. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, dear. You know, I think we're really lucky to have found you. Do you believe in luck, Don? Yeah, I do. Do you believe that I... Looking at the thousands of different types types of tea available to me. Guess your favorite kind by sheer luck? It's not impossible, I guess. It's not luck. I simply delved into your thoughts, dear. It is rather rude of me to not ask for permission first, I know. But my only interest was to serve you the best tea possible. Besides, you couldn't stop me if you tr even if you tried. <sighs> what do you mean? Every subatomic particle of this library is part of my, my being. Every single atom around you is at my command. But rest assured, dear, I have no intention of harming you or any of my other visitors. But it still happens. What are you talking about? Humans are not equipped to understand my true nature. Their minds shatter at a mere a glimpse, and I fear revealing my true nature would scare away visitors. I'd much rather keep it secret. It's not that hard to figure out you're no ordinary human. I have had such wonderful visitors as of late, but you, you are different, dear. I had expected you to run away as soon as I told you who I truly am. I cannot show you my true self. It would be a serious, serious risk to your safety, as I have said before. That's right, Blonde. You don't have to show me anything, okay? I trust you. Thank you, Don. You've been one of my favorite guests so far. Oh my, I'm drifting away from the topic. Do you truly believe it was luck or lack thereof that drove you here? That you crossed through the very fabric of reality by mere chance? Oh, my eye. I mean, I did by accident. I didn't really choose this. If it were up to me, I'd still be serving drinks at the Black Swan. I don't think so. Oh dear, there are many others out there like me, but they aren't as polite or nice. They plan and scheme in the void. They mean to harm you, your species, your entire reality. And judging by this database of yours, you seem to have come across some of them. What do you know? That's a question for another time, dear. Your colleagues are leaving soon. Please tread carefully through these back rooms. They're far too dangerous for humans like you. And I would love to have tea with you again someday. Me too. I promise I'll be back, Blonde. Here, take this. 
keep this book with you. Feel free to use it to visit me whenever you'd like, dear. There's plenty of hostile realities out there. It'd do you well to have a safe space, and I'll be more than glad to provide one. It's the least I can do for such an exceptional guest. Thank you. I think all of us could use that, to be honest. It's time to leave. Left to level 906, pretty easy to leave compared to the amount of dead ends you can run into oh, out there. Just have to ask one light nicely and she guide us to an exit. Right back to the hub. She calls us to crossroads. The rest of the team went to report back to base while I finished writing this log. I'm definitely paying level 906 a visit as soon as possible. Regardless of what, uh, of what the others think, Blonde's a real sweetheart, and I want to know more. Let's read the uh, rest of this level. Description. Level 906 is a massive, seemingly endless library, extensively decorated with elements of Gothic, Victorian, and Baroque architecture found in the front rooms. All attempts to take pictures, videos, or audio recordings of this level have failed, as cameras and recording equipment inexplic inexplicably malfunction in this level. Most of the library's wooden shelves are full of books, notebooks, folders, and a myriad of documents written in various languages. Most of them are incomprehensible. Some of these shelves are unaffected by gravity. Floating in place. And will require the use of wooden ladders to reach without, without aid. The library is lit by candle bars. By candle a lot of that, despite hanging down from the impossibly high ceiling, are capable of providing the entire library with proper illumination. The ceiling itself is already made with stained glass and painted landscapes. Reaching the ceiling is impossible, as the closer one gets, the farther it seems to be. The wooden floor feature is blue velvet carpet with golden ornaments. It's common to see books, folders, scrolls, or notes brought on in or clipping out of the the level. These range from ordinary books in various languages to ancient scrolls and forgotten alphabets, and everything in between, though they all carry Blonde's signature. We already know who Blonde is. The Cygnus Archive houses a unique entity who seems to have full control over the library itself. This entity has the appearance of a short, pale, a human woman, with long, and blonde hair and light blue eyes. She usually wears an intricate tea gown, though she's been seen wearing various other dresses and suits, from fall of, from ball gowns to butler suits and maid dresses, and calls herself blonde. She is very welcoming of visitors and will invite any who visit her library for tea. If the visitor is impolite, they will first be warned, then be and called out of a blonde for, on her Mac of 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 lanterns. If they refuse to change their behavior, they will be lectured in proper etiquette. Hostile visitors are immobilized by telekinetic force. If visitors continue to show hostile behavior, they will be kicked out of the library and back to the level they came from. Additionally, light guides are often found flowing through the a level. They even report to disappear spontaneously, flicker, and to move in seemingly random patterns. They are atypical when compared to instances of the same entity observed in other levels. Light guides. I might want to actually read about those. NC35, isn't that the curse number? Well, these are very short. Well, I guess I should probably have guessed that. <sighs> Description. Light guides are infinitely small points that radiate light, forming an orb-like appearance, similar to a singularity. They are quite rare to come across, but when found, can lead wanderers towards supplies and help them avoid dangerous entities. They can move freely, being able to change direction at will, and are also able to phase through walls. They appear in this sphere at random intervals, but can seemingly control when this occurs. Behaviors. Light guides are docile entities and no sign 
and so solidly has ever been documented. They have rudimentary communication being able to move around out of the dense like fashion and changing colors when two or more entities come across uh, each other. They, they will all work together in aiding a wanderer. They have commonly led wanderers to sources of almond water and other vital supplies. They seemingly have awareness of the a location of other entities and aid in helping travelers avoid them. They appear to have knowledge and sight of things beyond human comprehension due to their high to their nigh omniscient knowledge of the level what they are currently in. Biology. Light guides are infin infinitely small. All singularities of pure light, appearing spherical and ranging in size between 5 to 15 centimeters. It is impossible to kill a light guide as they can face through any and all objects. Discovery Light guides have been reported to exit is as long as the back rooms themselves. The first encounter with this ND was in level 4, with it leading a group of travelers to a crate of supplies. They are found in most levels, but are commonly found in levels of negative 0, 4, and 6. Notebook page from within level 2. What was that thing? Those very glowy things. Orbs of some kind of... I mean, just out of nowhere. Out of every oddity found within the, in the purgatory of existence. This is the one time I was actually helped by something. It led me to other survivors. Other people. Finally. It does, doesn't know... I don't know what that thing was, but I owe my life to it. I asked the other survivors if they've seen anything like this and told me I was hallucinating. I saw, no, I know these things are real. That ball of light, as dumb as it sounds, may very well be the last time I am shown any compassion. I don't know what those things are. Are angels, perhaps? Whatever they are, I, I sincerely thank them. Do's and don'ts. Do follow the light guides. Don't. Do not attempt to physically uh, attack them. They will not retaliate, but it seemingly bothers them. Do not steer off the path. You are receiving guidance. So light guides are more common than I thought, although only in certain levels. Notable areas. Blondes are office. The entry point for any and all who visit level 906. Blunt's office is a small area in the center of the level. This is where Blunt spends most of her time writing, reading, or waiting for guests. It contains a desk, various tables, chairs, shelves, with Blunt's favorite books and unfinished works. Some of the objects found in this room include a portrait of Blunt, drawn by E. Isle. We will be reading about them as soon as we're done reading about this level. An unfinished book titled Blunt's Guide to Comfort Food. Two hundred scrolls titled The Book of the Moon, verse 1, and The Scroll of Ascara, respectively. We already know about those stories. We read them. Several books on human, of human, on human philosophy. A folder containing several music sheets ranging from 14th century to the 1950s. Most of them read for harpsichord, organ, and piano. Various books of, of religious nature written in several languages. A life-size plushie of Captain with a sign around its neck that reads Free Hugs. A plethora of books on, on botany. A Columbina mask. I'm not going to read these because I think we have a lot to read already. Additionally, the following books were found to on a shelf of labeled to read lists. According to Blonde, these books were gifted or recommended to her by guests. The to read list. I can, uh. Oh! Blocked. Oh, that's interesting. Oh. <sighs> A full set of the Inkart trilogy by Cornel. Uh, Bunk, written in an unknown language. A Swedish copy of Foundation by Isaac Asimov. A Portuguese two volume edition of Dune by Frank Herbert. English editions of Necromancer, Count Zero, Mona Lisa Overdrive, and Burning Chrome by William Gibson. An English edition of Ready Player One by Ernest Klein. An English edition of A Wrinkle in Time by Madeleine and L. Engel, written 
It has been reported to glitch, flicker, uh, or be distorted in other ways. Several Warrior Cats books in various language, languages are written by Aaron Hunter. English cover of What If by Randall Monroe. A French translation of Pride and Prejudice by Jane and Austen. I think I just read that right. An English edition of Lego Omni Figure Year or by Year of Visual Dictionary by Gregory Ashtag and Daniel Olivkowitz. A collection of books by J.R.R. Tolkien, such as The Hobbit, The Sub. The Sub. And the Lord of the Rings series, all written in English. Stephen King's It translated to Romanian. A copy of uh, Noli Mi Tangre by Jose Agrizzo, written in, in Tagalog. An English edition of Magic by. I think it's actually Magic by Angie Sage. A French edition of uh, Toby Ilonis by Timothy D. No, Timothy. The day, Bombelli. I think I can't read French too well. An English edition of Cinder by Marissa Mayer, with a few loose notes inside. I had written in Tagalog. An English edition of Knots and Crosses by Mallory A. Blackman. A Maltese copy of Fahrenheit Four or Five One by Ray A. Bradbury. <sighs> The Tea Room The Tea Room is composed of a small kitchen area in the middle of the library. It contains a working oven and stove, various cabinets with several types of tea, and a cupboard full of porcelain cups and plates, as well as silver or tableware, and a vast amount of cooking books. This is where Blonde prepares her tea and biscuits, and sometimes full meals for her guests. Her tea sessions tend to last one to two hours. During said se Sessions, Blonde will attempt to chat with her guests and inquiring about various topics ranging from their lives to their interests and fields of expertise. The Guest Rooms Level 906 has an unknown number of empty e bedrooms designed to Blonde's guests. Blonde has shown to be careful of to freely charge and manipulate these rooms to better accommodate her guests and suit their needs. As such, the variable nature of these rooms make ex object. Active descriptions impossible. Injured guests will be taken to one of the guest rooms while Blonde tends their wounds. One of these rooms seems to be permanently occupied by her Hitler and OJ Tom von Haderach. I'm not reading any more about stuff right now. I'm sorry. Witnessing the beyond, it is rumored that prolonged exposure to level 906 may result in phenomenon colloquially known as witnessing the beyond. While there are no eyewitness accounts, factual reports, or any other sort of information, the rumor is too prevalent to ignore. It is said this anomaly caused severe damage to the nervous system, resulting in loss of memory, sense of identity, cognitive ability, and in some cases, death. Basis, Communities, and Outposts There are no basis, communities, or outposts on this level, but some, say some visitors spend weeks or even months living in one of the library's guest rooms. Entrances and Exits is the unknown way to enter the Cygnus archive is to be teleported into it by dragging your index finger through Blonde's signature from left to right. In one of her books, the documents scattered throughout the back rooms, although in some cases a mere touch is enough. All attempts to recreate this with pictures, copies, readings, or photocopies of the signature have yielded no re results. And I just uh, says that out to myself, no results. I mean, to be fair, the back rooms aren't real. Alright, exits. <sighs> In order to oh, exit level 906, politely ask Blonde to leave. She will guide you to an exit to the She will guide you to an exit to a level of your choosing, provided it is a safe level. It is also possible to leave level 906 by displaying excessively rude or hostile behavior. In that, clay, in that case, you will be forcefully teleported out of the level, back to where you were when you entered. If it was a safe level, or to a safe if level if not. As Blonde seems to not want to hurt her guests. 
How do I... I don't know if I can read this. Oh, thank goodness. It's not that long. <sighs> oh. So this is E. Isle, a former senior archivist of the of Meg. Last known uh, locations are the Meg base of operations level four and level four of four, which is I think an unknown level or something. Egal was a 24-year-old person of Irish-French descent and, and formerly provided service as senior archivist to several organizations prior to her unexplained disappearance. Having experience in technology work prior to her appearance in the back rooms, her ex expertise has been an invaluable asset to documentation of a large number of, number of levels and entities, many of which possess info as its properties. A portion of the back rooms archival database was personally programmed by IELT. Her insight continues to guide researchers on its development in her absence. After Z, after Z returned to base Omega from an unplanned exploration of level 44 in order to document heaven and her inhabitants, our report it, it approves the unseen affinity with technology, enabling her to interface with and and if like digital data directly. At this time, a photographic anomaly was also noted, creating glitch visual artifacts in all photos taking of her, as well as obscuring her face. One month after her return from level 404, I, I disappeared without explanation from her workstation in Base Omega, leaving behind only flat intersection visual artifacts with similar appearance to her to their photographic anomaly. Meg personnel are respectfully advised not to approach these artifacts. Consequently, Ayo's workstation remains vacant. Several unfinished documents were recovered from her, her terminal after her, her disappearance. Her current status is unknown. That's a link? I'm not clicking on it right now. We already have too much behaviors. I was known to be polite, cordial, cordial and soft-spoken. If asked about it at times. Hang on, I'm going to take a drink. That's some good tea. Anyway. And dedicate to her work. Her tendency to place safety of others above her own was well known, often resulting in physical or psychological injury. Zay was frequently described as introverted, compassionate, and gentle, and was reportedly close with the overseer B. Al was a valued researcher and a dear friend to many. Zay will be missed. This one in for, oh, interview. Begin log. Icon, there we go. This is for my file? Yeah, just describe yourself and your work. It's not all that big a deal. Only about 63% of our database. It's just infrastructure. I'm glad I, I could still help. That's right, too. Are you, you know, feeling okay after 404? Don't tell anyone. <laughs> I mean, other than whoever bothers to read my file. I won't. I... I don't know. I feel strange. Disconnected. It's nice being able to look at the data I'm working with, but I can't feel, help but feel like it's starting to... No, no. I'm okay. I'm okay. I have to keep looking into this. I just feel like I'm on the verge of something big, you know? Something that will save lives. I have to keep at it just a little longer. I can't let it... <sighs> Sorry. It's fine. The room wavers for some reason. Just take care of yourself, okay? Yeah. Thanks, Redacted. Both laugh weakly. And log. Huh. <sighs> 
and Z180. It lives exclusively on 906 these days. After all, it is Flan's cat, I have, I'm assuming. Description Barry is a black cat that appeared, as to be of the domestic long haired breed. He has been reported to have ability to enlighten or ascend water to gaze into his eyes. He is constantly surrounded by his protective worshippers. <laughs> Behaviors Barry can allegedly enlighten waters when they look into his eyes. His worshippers refer to this phenomenon as visions of reality. Barry is able to make those vocalizations, but only those are typical of cats to communicate he will stare into the eyes of his followers. It is currently unknown what information they receive during these interactions, but they are then able to speak for Barry. His worshippers, who refer to themselves as missionaries, will protect Barry at all costs and provide constant food and attention. It is believed that Barry cannot control all his effects, but will not unintentionally prevent waters from falling victim to them. Barry is also only becoming angry when held for extended periods of time. Barry can be given food and attention, but it is recommended to do so with caution. The missionaries are quite protective of him and will fight off any who they see as threatening. Do not mention Jerry, ne or Barry, or his followers. This will cause an immediate hostile reaction. Kind of curious about what this is. History personality. He's so sweet. Barry is an absolute treat to be in the company of. He is so sweet crawling up on my lap while, while I'm reading. He spends most of the time sleeping on the various chairs throughout my home. I can see why you all adore him so much, much dear visionaries. Biology. Barry appears to be a neutered male cat of older age. His fur is black, with no one notable feature being two white whiskers. There is on the left side of his face. Barry does not have to eat, but will eat nearly anything not directly plant-based. It's highly recommended to not make direct eye contact with berries, as this causes waterers to become enlightened. His followers, only comprised of waterers, are fully capable of function similar to normal humans, but are extremely protective of berry and worship him similarly to a deity. It is the rest of berry gain these properties after an accidental encounter with Entity 140, or Blonde, as we are going to understand 140 to be right now. I'm sorry, Barry. Barry, my dear, I apologize for what happened. I had never meant for you to witness the beyond, but you were too close to that unfortunate wanderer. I understand why you ran away, though. I hope you forgive me. Do know that I will always welcome you back, Barry. <sighs> Discovery. The first ever sighting of Barry was approximately 400 years ago. Barry typically ha has 10 to 20 worshippers surrounding him at once. Do not attempt any interaction unless necessary. Barry can typically be found in level 4 or f level 512. I'm sorry, visionaries, but Barry is back where he belongs. Back at home, with me. I hope you all understand, but fortunately, I know you won't. Barry is safer with me than he ever was with you, and I intend to keep it that way. Understood? Lon. Do's and don'ts. Do you provide food and attention to Barry if possible. Interact with the visionaries in a calm but assertive manner. Don't look into Barry's eyes. Don't react to Barry or his worship at first in a hostile manner. Don't mention Jerry near the visionaries. Don't hold Barry for extended periods of time. Level 6.1. Oh, this is the snack rooms. Okay, it's a sub-level. We can read more about that another time. Object 15, Fire Assault. I was curious about this, so we're going to read it today. 
Fire Assault is while crystal information with explosive properties typically used as weapons within the back rooms. Description Fire Assault is a volatile crystalline formation found within the back rooms. They are most commonly found as irregular shaped shards between 105 centimeters in size, colored orange, and slightly translucent. Large artificial fire salt ingots, on the other hand, are more transparent and colored a dark shade of red. Molten fire salt, nicknamed the Iroil is a colorless flammable liquid with a small remnants of incense. Fire salt crystals are relatively hard, classifying in the most scale of mineral hardness as a 7. The metal's hardness scale is a scale used to determine the hardness of substance through scratching other materials. In this case, fire salt ranks at 7, which means they can be scratched by quartz, but not by softer materials. Far quite real make them vulnerable to impact damage. They are also soluble in water and almond water, generating heat when dissolving in both liquids. In addition, they have a low fusion point of approximately 47 and, and degrees Celsius, whereupon reaching inks that has threshold the crystal melts into clear air pyrrole, which is able to efficiently burn on even on low oxygen atmospheres. Furthermore, or pyrrole oil can be cooled down to create large artificial Fire salt ingots. Fire salt's most of its property is its reactivity against impact damage. When thrown, fire salt crystals easily shatter, generating a moderate quantity of heat and a remarkable quantity of light in the shape of burning sparks, enough to cause first or second degree burns on humans with a direct hit. Larger manufactured ingots or crystals of a mass greater than 50 grams are able to explode and in a manner similar to TNT. Equate to approximately half the energy of a dynamite stick for a fire salt ingot of 100 grams. It is to note that the aforementioned explosion does not seem to damage the overall integrity of the backgrounds themselves. Uses Small fire salt crystals are used by backrooms explorers as self defense weapons, as they can be easily primed and its small explosives can be used to surprise, hurt, or scare away both hostile entities and humans. Its overall common nature makes fire salt the weapon of choice of many explore explorers, also being fashioned and into simple to carry firecrackers. Large ingots, however, are used as tools of as a tool of war, as its destructive power can easily obliterate enemy platoons or hordes of entities. However, the infrastructure needs to create sizable quantities of such ingots ensures that only large or well prepared organizations or factions are able to produce them. Moreover, moreover some use of use heat release when dissolving fire salt in water and on, on water to boil foodstuffs and liquids, making a couple of fire salt crystal, crystals an easy alternative to making a potentially dangerous fire in order to dis disinfect any e harvested at on water from the disease or other maladies. These pyro Oil, on the other hand, has been used as substitutes to gasoline to power any small vehicle in the back rooms. As well as fuel to any generators if no electric outlets are available. Obtaining Small fire salt crystals can be obtained growing on corners within and the first five levels of the, the back rooms, as well as in smaller, rarer quantities and levels similar to level zero. However, larger explosive fire salt crystals cannot be found naturally, but rather have to be manufactured by melting together several crystals. Pyro can only be obtained through the fusion of fire salt crystals as well. I think that I'll just. I think these are the only two links I need for the video. Anyway. That is an hour and a half video. I hope that makes up for this coming out at like 9.30 or 10. If you liked this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. And please remember, I do have a debut coming out on the 23rd that I hope I can actually make it to. I don't know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, but I'm guessing it's probably going to be either more SCP stuff, more backroom stuff, or something else that I find some weird interest in.
I guess we'll find out tomorrow. Until then, goodbye!